next video, we're going to get into compassion. And compassion is a topic that's often taught earlier on in the quarter. It appears pretty early in your textbook. I've held off until the end of the quarter because there's an aspect of soil mechanics, in particular unsaturated soil mechanics, that to me makes compassion a little bit of a complicated topic. Um, the actual mechanics of compassion are really just phase relationships. So that part is easy. As soon as you've complete, completed phase diagrams, you can basically do everything you need to do with compaction. But understanding why compaction works requires a little bit of knowledge of unsaturated soil mechanics. And only after we understand dry and fully saturated soil behavior, or effective stress and total stress analyses, is another way of thinking about it, can we really go on to understand uh, compaction and unsaturated soil mechanics. So the idea of compaction is that oftentimes we need to perform some grading. The soil surface is not exactly at the right elevation, or there's topography that we need to flatten out. A common case is that maybe we have a hill like this and we want to build on it, so we cut the top of the hill and fill in the valley. And there are big portions of Southern California that have this very configuration. We have a lot of hills down here, so we'll come and cut this soil and prepare it, grind it all up, and then carefully compact it in the valley to create this nice flat ground. Now, of course, if you were buying these houses, you would definitely want the house that's right on the cut, not on the fill, right? Because one, usually when you cut this, the soil's nice and dense and strong right there. And when we compact, it needs to be done carefully. If you mess up compaction, all of this soil might settle, and these houses might have damage as a result. Of course, the price of all these houses is going to be the same Maybe even some of these will be more expensive if they're bigger or have a nicer view or something like that. So if we're going to do this, if we're going to take cut material and compact it to make a fill, we really have to answer two questions. So what density do we need to achieve? And in particular, it's not the total density that we're interested in. Uh, the easiest way to make soil denser is to just fill up the void space with water. You increase the total unit weight that way. That doesn't do anything to increase the strength and stiffness of the soil. So what we focus on here is what dry density do we need? How closely packed do the solid particles need to be in order for us to achieve the desired strength and stiffness? And then the other one is what water content should we use? It turns out that the water content has a really important impact on our ability to obtain a particular dry density. And, and that's where the unsaturated soil mechanics comes in. So at the end of this lecture, you should have an appreciation for why the water content at the time of compaction is such an important consideration. So compacted fill is generally unsaturated. And what we do um, is we'll, we'll cut the soil or go get it from a, what's called a borrow source. That's where we're borrowing soil. And then condition it with water to bring it to some desired water content then compact it by rolling heavy equipment over it or using vibratory compaction to uh, make it denser. So it consists of solids, fluids, and gases all together. And so the rest of this lecture will really focus on understanding the fundamentals of unsaturated soil mechanics. One thing that I'll point out, compaction is the act of expelling air from the soil. Right? It's not the same as consolidation. So the difference in those two words is that consolidation is expulsion of pore water from saturated soil. Compaction is expulsion of air from unsaturated soil. So you bring the particles closer together and all that air comes out. All right, so let's get into unsaturated soil mechanics and matrix suction. So this idea of matrix suction is the important consideration here. So uh, probably, you know, we live in Southern California near the beach. Probably all of us have had the experience of going to the beach to build a sandcastle. I know my kids loved building sandcastles when they were kids. Sometimes we still do it now, even though they're um, a little bit older. And one thing that you will notice if you try to build a sandcastle is if you make the soil too dry, like if you just go and scoop up all that dry sand and put it in the bucket or whatever you're using to form the castle, it doesn't work. You lift up the bucket and you just form a little hill, and the, you know, the angle of this hill is roughly equal to the friction angle of the sand. It's just going to run out into a cone shape. Similarly, if you make it too wet, like if you go down right there where the water is coming in, you get saturated sand in your bucket, flip it over, raise the bucket, it just becomes 
becomes like this muddy mess of mush, and it doesn't hold its shape. So there's kind of like the Goldilocks amount of water, the just right amount, where you can actually form shapes with it. You lift up the bucket, it stays like that. Now this shape is probably not really very good, <laughs> but it'd be pretty difficult to make that kind of shape if any of you can do it. Send me a photo. I want to see the sandcastle wizards out there making these sorts of things. And uh, also, this sandcastle won't last forever. Right? Eventually, either water will soak in because a wave comes and hits it, maybe knocks it over, or it will get dried out and crumble. And you'll start to see sand falling off the edges. So, why do sandcastles work? Only if we add just the right amount of water. That's something that's probably really intuitive. Like, we physically know that that happens. But what is it that's happening in between the soil particles that makes that happen? There must be something holding those particles together, making them behave like they're cemented in some way. Well, it turns out that that water is what does it. So a couple more concepts that all of you are probably familiar with from various laboratory experiments you've done is the concept of meniscus, right? So when we put a fluid in a graduated cylinder, usually we read the bottom of the meniscus because the volume of water that's kind of in this little curve area up against the glass is really small, so you read the bottom of it and ignore that little volume above. Well, that's caused by tension at the air-water interface, and it interacts in a way that causes the water to rise up against the uh, edges of the glass. Usually, a graduated cylinder has a pretty big diameter, so you really only see the meniscus right at the edges, and then it's pretty flat in the middle. Uh, if you make a really small capillary tube, like with uh, some millimeter sized openings, you would see the water rises up pretty high in there. And so what happens is that the tension pulling up on that water, basically this curvature requires some tension, right? So the tension raises the water a little bit up at the edges of the glass. If the glass um, sides are really close together, there's a lot of curvature of that water. Like this radius of curvature is very small. And that causes more tension, so the water rises up higher into a capillary tube. may even come out all the way over the top. And you've probably witnessed this, too, if you've cleaned up a spill. You take a paper towel and just kind of dip the tip of the paper towel in the liquid, and it will raise the liquid up into the paper. That's because of capillary rise or this, um, this water tension at the, at the water-air interface. So um, this happens with soil. Here's an example of four solid particles, and we're going to focus our attention on that little void space right there. Uh, if the void space is unsaturated, involving water and air, so it's not fully saturated, it's not fully dry, the degree, degree of saturation is somewhere between 1 and 100, then you have a mix of water and air. And the air tends to form little bubbles. Okay, And those bubbles have curved surfaces. So it's just like the meniscus, right? That's a curved surface resulting in some tension. Strongly curved surface here in the capillary tube. The void spaces are often really small, kind of similar to a capillary tube, so you get a lot of curvature of that little air bubble. And as a result of that curvature, uh, the, the air bubble creates tension in the water. So the, the pore pressure here in the water is actually negative. And that's a little bit counterintuitive. <laughs> It doesn't really make a lot of intuitive sense to us that you would get negative pore pressure just by having this air bubble in there, but in fact it does happen. And if you look more closely at the point where two solid particles come together, there, the water would tend to cling to the solid particle and you get this strong curvature in the um, surface, so that's like a meniscus effect. And that generates these um, forces that pull the particles together and creates negative water pressure and positive effective stress. So if we come back up here to our sandcastle, the total stress is very low, right? Maybe close to zero because the unit weight of the sand is so small. Certainly zero along these surfaces, so the sand would have no strength on the surface, and that's why it forms this angle of repose or friction angle. Um, but we can form vertical walls here if we have just the right amount of water in there and air. Because now the effective stress is not zero, right? The total stress is zero along that wall, but because of the negative pore pressure, there's effective stress pushing those particles together from the water inside and from the air bubbles. So this, this tension is called matrix suction. So if you hear somebody talk about matrix suction, they're talking about unsaturated soil and the effective stress that you get. 
from having a mix of water and air in the pore space. Negative pore pressure. All right, so um, sandcastles stay together. Sigma prime is greater than zero because we have sigma V prime is equal to sigma V minus U, right? Vertical effective stress equation. If U is a negative number and sigma V is zero, then sigma V prime is a positive number, right? The particles are being held together. All right, now matrix suction is large in soils with small void spaces. So um, if you have, say, a, a clay, uh, the, the void space in that clay is really tiny because the clay minerals are tiny. You can get really huge matrix suction if that clay is unsaturated water mixed together. On the other hand, if you have coarse sand or gravel, the void space is really big, the meniscus, the curvature is not that big, and the, you know, the forces induced by the negative core pressure are not that big compared to um, the, the weight of those particles. So the kinds of soils that generate the most matrix suction have some fines in them. If you have a coarse sand or a medium sand that has silted clay in the void space, then you can get high matrix suction because of the silt and clay in that void space. So when we compact soils, usually we want some kind of fines in there. Some silt, some clay, it's often called the binder, pulls the soil together and allows you to compact it. If you have um, coarse sand or gravel, it doesn't compact very well, right? You can put a lot of energy in it, it's hard to get it to become denser. Uh, okay, and that's it for this lesson, and we'll go on to talk about